H-A-V-E-F-U-N. Have fun! Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, otherwise known as Forum BX57, here to bring you another 1980s and 90s G.I. Joe tour review. And for my fourth and final review for my Naval Theme Month, I'll be taking a look at the Cobra Sea Marauding Boat, the 1990 Piranha. The Piranha makes its first comic book appearance in the old mobile comic run of G.I. Joe in issue number 110, and makes its first cartoon appearance in the Deke animated television episode titled Revenge of the Pharaohs. First, I'll take a look at the Piranha's armament, starting off with its torpedoes. It has two different types of torpedoes located all over the boat. But first, I'll take a look at this large one, mounted on the side, on this peg. Now, this peg actually fits either version of the torpedo. You'll also notice, strangely enough, that the peg is actually angled downwards. A very nice, realistic touch, because as a torpedo, this thing wouldn't fly off. It would actually uh, fall into the water, then take off. Next, we have the smaller torpedoes, two of which are located on the spoiler. And the next two are located underneath the hull, ready to be launched I love the attention to detail that they've actually put into the torpedoes, such as having propellers at the ends of both of them, as well as the fins actually being a corkscrew shape. We have driver positionable guns, which swing out that far and can be straightened only about that much. They, uh, they don't go beyond that range, but they do have little hand holds each, so you can pretend that the figure is actually holding on to those and uh, firing them or positioning them to where he wants to go. And now for the Piranha's gimmick feature. Like a lot of 1990 and upwards vehicles, they had a missile launcher or some type of a, a firing or spring-loaded gimmick. And the Piranha is no different, although it's not spring-loaded, but it's still a gimmick and it still fires. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to put your finger behind this depth charge barrel and you're going to go like this. It actually does work, but as you can see, it's a flick fire method. And the depth charges themselves are a little bit hollow, but not hollow all the way through, which is very interesting. And now to take a look at some of the interesting details of the Piranha, starting with the seating. Now, it only holds one figure, which kind of makes sense and kind of doesn't at the same time, because this was an under $10, well, at least back in 1990, basic small vehicle. But this thing has a really large bow, and it certainly has enough space back here for at least one or two foot pegs. So I don't really understand why you only have uh, room for one figure. But as you can see, in the seating, we have a seat clip. Now, Prior to 1990, we had uh, these seat belt things, which, to be quite honest, were a little bit awkward, and I'm glad that they phased them out um, during the 1990 year. I think uh, one or two vehicles in 1990 still had seat belts. But honestly, this is a good idea when the vehicle needs it. But I don't think the Piranha really needs this. You fit this thing around the waist of a figure. I'm just going to use this 1990 Range Viper, for instance, and it fits around him quite easily, despite the fact that he actually has kind of a bulky waist. So this is actually a fairly good design, very, very generic for any type of figure you might want. And as you can see, this thing had a slot in the seat. You just pop the figure in there, line up the slot with the uh, that back uh, peg, and he fits in really nice. As you can see, he, um, he actually rides a little bit higher than he would if he was just sitting without the peg, uh, without the C-clip, I should say. But he does kind of reach over onto the, um, 
the hand holds for the guns, and you know it's his arms are straight, so it looks okay. However, without the seat clip, he sits in there just fine. As a matter of fact, he sits what to me looks more like properly in the seat, even though he now has to raise his hands a little bit to reach the handholds for the guns. But other than that, <laughs> I think it's perfectly fine. And without the seat clip, I mean, he's not really going anywhere anyways. I mean, on like a hand glider or something like that, uh, I, I totally understand, or if the figures really does not have any type of a cockpit or anything, that's fine. But for this, that was just kind of a waste. And I can kind of understand why some sellers uh, or even some collectors just kind of take these things out and just kind of leave them out. There is some really nice detail for the dashboard. None of it is picked out with stickers, but it's nice that there are molded deal, dials and switches and whatnot there. Of course, this thing has a big jet engine on the back here. You can actually turn it a little bit. It's not supposed to be turning, but uh, it's just sort of uh, clicked in there. And one thing which is the bane of most uh, G.I. Joe collectors, antenna. Of course, it has two tiny little antenna here. As a matter of fact, you can kind of straighten them out or, or just sort of bow them out. On the front of the boat, we have these little loops and they're meant for you to put a little string through them and tie them to your pretend dock. Or if you had a anchor from somewhere, you could tie it through there. It's rather unfortunate that these loops are really tiny because you really need to put some thread through there rather than uh, a thick string. On the bottom, there isn't really too much detail except for the bottom of uh, the jet there. It is bisected by this huge spine. That's very interesting. But I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say that there necessarily has to be a lot of detail underneath here because, well, it's nice that this thing is all closed up the way it is because that means it floats. It seems like Cobra got the lion's share of aquatic vehicles, which kind of makes sense seeing as in the comic books, Cobra was based on an island. So before we get the 1990 Piranha, we had the 1986 Hydro Sled, a small under $10 vehicle, which did not come with a figure, just like the Piranha. But we have a more iconic vehicle, which matches that. And that is the 1985 Night Landing. Of course, here I have it with figures in them, but none of them came with figures, keeping the costs down. And even though I've called them all small aquatic vehicles, honestly, they all serve a completely different function. With the big jet engine on the back of the Piranha, this thing is an ocean-going escort, whereas this thing with its mostly flat surface is something which you would think that um, Figures like the Hydro Viper or the Eels would actually dive off of and be recovered from. And of course, the night landing is just that, a silent night landing dinghy. They even look good all together like this, with the night landing being all dark blue, the Hydro Sled being dark blue and maroon, and the Piranha being all maroon. So just what would the opposite number for the Piranha be on the G.I. Joe side? Well, if you discount the number of years apart in release year, it's quite easy to call the Piranha's opposite number, the 1986 Devilfish. They have just about the same amount of armament. However, if you were to look at something which is closer in year, we have the 1990 Sky Patrol Sky Shark. Even though this is technically a flying submarine, it still had aquatic properties and could still go technically toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Piranha. Now here's a question for all my viewers. Who would you use as the driver for your Piranha? Or if you have a Piranha already in your collection, who do you use? Here I have the 1990 Range Viper simply because he's on the box art, but is he the best choice for a driver for the Piranha? Maybe not. The only basic figure released in 1990 that was an aquatic figure, unfortunately, is the Undertoes, 
who, while he looks good in it, because he does have that uh, dark red, which kind of is close to the maroon, and of course the gray kind of matches with the maroon uh, as well, the fact of the matter is, is that he's an Iron Grenadier and not a Cobra. Kind of makes me wonder whether this thing should have been an Iron Grenadier boat instead. But, going back a few years, we also have the 1988 Hydro Viper, who, again, he looks okay in here, especially with this dark red matching the maroon a bit. He also does have little pops of yellow as well, which goes along with the Piranha. As I've said before, the Piranha is an unusually large vehicle, which is supposed to be in the small basic line. And here, I'll just put this thing side by side with a 1984 Cobra Water Moccasin. And yes, I understand the Water Moccasin is actually a bit smaller than it really should be, considering its price point. And then again, it did come with a figure, which kind of bumps up the price range anyway. But this is considered a medium-sized vehicle. Yeah, okay, it's six years apart, but still, they're the same length. The Piranha is a really good bargain for your money. And now for the comparison that I know you've all been waiting for. That is the 1990 Piranha side-by-side -side with the 1985 Moray Hydrofoil. And of course, that's where you have that symbol being duplicated there. It's clear the designers want to make a small version of the Hydrofoil. And I think they've done so in this tiny little jet-powered boat. And while I know a lot of people really don't like the um, Piranha because of its aggressive use of yellow plastic, the fact of the matter is that the Mori also had yellow plastic uh, weaponry as well. Maybe not as much as this, but still it is there. The other very interesting thing is that due to the fact that the um, the piranhas are actually a bit cheaper and easier to find than a fully complete moray. You can probably just buy a single moray and have several of these piranhas as escort vehicle. They really do look good as a whole fleet. If you're looking for a piranha on the aftermarket, they're not that rare, but they are getting harder to find and for a good price nowadays, simply because a lot of people are starting to army build these things. But if you're patient, you can still find one complete with all of its parts fairly easily and fairly for a fairly good price, I would say. However, there are a lot of these spare parts on the aftermarket as well, so it should be fairly easy to build one up if you find one with a few missing parts for a good cheap bargain. There are a few things that you do have to look out for. Of course, that is the these tabs which stick out way far out um, on either side. These can be snapped off, kind of hard to see in photographs sometimes, as well as the two tines which hold the uh, depth charges. They can be one or two of them, or even the, both of them could be uh, snapped off, unfortunately. The torpedoes themselves, like I said, are fairly easy to find on the aftermarket. Less so the depth charges, but again, you can still find them fairly easily, as well as the guns. But you do have to be careful with the guns because there is a left and a right side. So if you're missing one of them, you have to be sure which side that you're actually trying to find. And of course, there is the bane of all G.I. Joe collectors, as I said before, antenna. These are tiny little antenna, which, to be honest, they're sturdy and they hold in really well, but of course they can be either broken off or just sort of popped off.
episode titled Revenge of the... the This thing is way old and I'm not... Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.